want to welcome everybody. As a first thing, I want to welcome everybody who, had, who is tuning in to this program. Really wonderful to see you. We have quite a few new um, audience members, so welcome. My name is Milana Streziva, and I am the Artistic Director of Grand Piano Series, and we are based in Naples, Florida. And uh, we have three exciting concerts coming up next week with Asia Koripanova, uh, who is going to play all 24 list etudes. And mm -hmm. she's doing uh, three performances in a row. And I said, we will be cheering for you. It's like almost like a sports event, seriously. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're saying this because um, it brings me an awesome uh, opportunity to start a conversation on this note. Because um, you see, in a lot of people's minds, when we hear list, we think, oh my God, this is something bravura, something virtuosic, something difficult, something crazy, someone has sore fingers, someone <laughs> has tendonitis, and so forth, so forth. And specifically, when we talk about list attitudes, we think about first uh, their difficulty. And my journey with List at You started many years ago. I was, um, my, my very first uh, List at You I played when I was 11 years old. It was just one uh, etude is the second uh, one from three concert etudes that I will be playing in the second half of my program <clears throat> this time. And uh, it was probably one of the easier ones that I could uh, afford playing at that age. And I was thinking, oh my God, this is so difficult. How difficult must be the other pieces? And then as time went by, at a certain point I progressed and I started playing transcendental attitudes. And the first three transcendental attitudes that I played were Mazeppa, Eroica, and Ricordanza from the transcendental attitudes. And I got instantly fascinated but the fact that Mazeppa also exists in a form of symphonic poem that bears the same music material and uh, has almost exactly the same shape as a piece. And it's a very, very big piece and, yes, uh, very demanding, but having a reference of orchestral music in that piece was mind-turning for me. And I thought, huh, if he, if he thought that this material could, you know, be sufficient and wonderful both for a symphonic piece and for a piano piece, that means that all the other piano etudes potentially could be seen as potential symphonic poems. And that thought basically forever changed the way I look at these etudes. And to me, the mere physical difficulty of playing each of them somewhat became easier as I started searching for other matters, for colors, for expression, for uh, images, for ideas, and for dif different things that would make these etudes stand on their own and become more uh, become less etude-like and more uh, symphonic poem-like. And at the same time, uh, uh, in the time similar to uh, all these discoveries that came to my mind, uh, was the period when I thought, why don't I try merging my lifelong fascination with uh, visual art and poetry and I was working both in both fields separately since I was very little. And so I thought, why don't I um, try to create something that f specifically for this music, specifically inspired by music, not necessarily trying to illustrate or explain, but give, provide some associations that uh, these pieces bring to my mind. And uh, it was very difficult because I found that whatever was coming 
into my mind that I could speak of in words, not necessarily was matching my visual imagery. So um, I will show you uh, my poems. And I thought uh, it would be probably easier than just reading from the screen. I thought I would give you a link in the chat box and then I will share my screen as well. But I will give you a link to a place where all of my poems can be read at once in one um, in one line. It is a, a page on my website. And another thing that I would do is I would give you another page uh, of my website that has some, uh, all of them, uh, that has my artwork. So, the transcendental etudes are not necessarily equal to each other. Some of them are more massive, some of them are more um, elusive, and the strangest one is probably the first one. It's called Prelude, and it takes about 40 seconds to play. And it's, it, to me, it was always like a pianist comes on stage. And keep in mind, in um, 19th century, traveling pianists often spent three weeks on a carriage before seeing a piano again. <laughs> so I would always imagine Liszt coming into this new concert hall, new for him, People are waiting for him. He hasn't touched piano for a long time. I, I, I know that probably the real situation was not necessarily like that, but it is just, it's just like some kind of image. Comes, does this, and then goes, let me try what the piano is, is capable of, and goes. <laughs> up and down that cover the entire span of the instrument and can pass for a quick warm-up or trying what the piano is capable of. And um, that puzzled me always because there's no really, uh, there's no theme to that etude. There is no any kind of development. It's just a few passages up and down, but it's just like you come to a noisy place and you try to figure it out. And so um, when I was <clears throat> thinking of an image, I also was thinking about how a, a, a person's hand can uh, go and provide a lot of different things at the same, okay at the same time. So this, can you see it? Yeah, so this was my idea about a person's hand and how they um, shine around all different things that are not connected to each other, but provide some halo of material. And there are details in this image uh, that relate to all the other 12 pictures that, other 11 pictures that follow. Uh, and the poem for that uh, would be, okay, I'm a little bit um, slow here, but I will, I will, I will gain some speed, <laughs> I promise. Uh, one second. Okay, here we go. I walk along a festive street amidst the city noise and flare, and for the crowds that I meet, I celebrate I do not care. And nothing bothers me as I walk by and listen to the glee. 
The clown shows catch my eye, but they don't mean too much to me. And through the babble dapplet fun and urban smells and loud hooray, I feel the breathing of the sun that shed itself onto my way. Just like a um, impression that is short but can have a long description <laughs> sort of thing. Um, the second etude I nicknamed, it doesn't have a name, doesn't have a, a very, how would I say, it doesn't have lyricism in it almost at all, but it has this tune that made me think of it this is like uh, a Destiny's Call from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, because it goes... And the pop 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 pom goes throughout the whole piece in different forms. The rhythm stays the same, and it's just like this nagging on something that almost like a battlefield or or some trumpet call or a, a hunting or something like that. So it it was uh, interesting to me that Les didn't have a name for this etude. Just it's called number two, <laughs> and th and that's it. And, but that trumpet-like call uh, allowed me to think of that as some somewhat related. To, to a battle. And because of that, I had this image of something with trumpets and with a horse and with some spikes and with some, something that, um, like a fantasy that features different images related to uh, warriorship and, and things like that. Uh, and the, the, the poem for that goes like this. The threshold of the war, transparent imprecation over the sails, and horses' helpless call and its reverberation. And you can hear banners murmur and itty bitty bridges rattle, and take in the gunpowder odor and cannon philharmonic brattle, relying on his will in secret, immortal nature's love is real. It outruns the slow time. It plays with stars and spins the magic wheel. And that spins the magic wheel, it's almost like an uh, exact impression of the piece because it sort of spins as it goes. And uh, Playing it, you definitely feel like you're going through a few circles, uh, returning and, and, and still spinning faster and faster, and, and the piece becomes faster uh, at, the very, at the very end. It, it, it speeds up. So this is um, sort of the, the approach that uh, I have been having. Uh, let me know if you would like to uh, me to read all of these <clears throat> poems myself, or I also could uh, just provide them to you to read as, um, as I gave you the link for them. But this project originally was performed in a space that allowed um, to project the artwork on the big screen at the time of the performance. And so I could play while the correspondent uh, image would be projected and I would read the poem before the uh, corresponding uh, etude in between. And so it became sort of a multimedia performance. Uh, and I also later realized that <clears throat> this type of pairing different artwork and different poetry or literature with music became very popular recently. 
in recent couple of decades. But people try to find something that they have associations. I don't know, playing WC with money <laughs> or something like that. And I thought that uh, having similar idea, but having that coming from the same source could be something of a change. So, uh, Aisha, a, a question. Um, I, I don't know if, if you intend to uh, uh, kind of talk about all the attitudes, but um, what drew you to list in particular? Why did you? Uh, because I, I, I did notice you you enjoy uh, uh, larger scopes of works. So, yeah, and I, I, I'm curious what it is that inspires you about Liszt's music as a performer. It has been a transition. In the beginning, when I was still a teenager, of course, it was something uh, related to uh, a pianist growing their technique and playing more demanding repertoire and learning from that. But as I grew more attached to uh, the idea of finding uh, more colorful images in these etudes. Uh, and as I also, on the side, played bigger scale works by Liszt, such as both of his sonatas and some of his opera fantasies and his Schubert transcriptions and uh, things like that, I realized that there is a big opportunity still in Liszt's music uh, to find new ways of sound for that and find new new ideas. I know, I mean, everything these days is new and innovative and, <laughs> or backwards, we're authentic and we're gonna play lists on a barely sounding <laughs> fortepiano that <laughs> weak, <laughs> that is weak and very light. But see, for instance, if we look at Bach, Bach has been studied and overstudied and played in all, but by greatest uh, performers of all times, performed by likes of Wanda Landowska, who built her own massive harpsichord that had many stops and sounded like an organ. <laughs> uh, we had obviously Glenn Gould and Rosalind Turk. We had people like Wilhelm Kempf, who played with lots of pedal in the, in the madly romantic style, but still convincingly. We had Svetoslav Richter, who played very, very dry and almost... Uh, not trying intentionally not to touch you with their performance, but least mostly was taken by generations of pianists as a tour de force of simple pianistic brilliance. And it remains this way. But uh, I had a funny uh, arg argument with my conservatory teacher. <clears throat> she said, you're playing some of Liszt etudes, like you're playing late Bruckner and other <laughs> late German romantic music. And she said that as a, as a, as a criticism, but I was so proud. I was just like, wow, <laughs> that means I was able to find something unusual that kind of goes against the tradition and uh, irritates my teacher. Uh, and uh, over the time, I found a way to merge my late Brucknerism and other <laughs> German <laughs> symphonic style of thinking of the Liszt etudes uh, with a more conventional uh, performance. But up to these days, um, bringing this program back and this program as a 24 Liszt etudes, I played the first time in 2017. And then I played it again in 2019, and then I'm playing it again now. Each time returning to it, inevitably opening the score and uh, practicing, I find something else. I find something that I did not notice before, even though I've been playing Transcendental Etudes as a set since I was 21 years old. And then I was playing Paganini's <clears throat> six etudes uh, after Paganini as a 
set separately also for a while. And this music has been in my head for many, many years, but there's still so much to discover. And it's very exciting because each time I find something, I want to bring it out. I want to present it, but then I, I set it aside and some time passes and I return to it and I'm like, huh, this is something else I've noticed just now. <laughs> Let me work on it. So that aspect is very exciting to me. Well, to me personally, it's going to be interesting because um, as a performer myself, I know that there is never the same performance twice, right? So oh, no, no, no such thing. <laughs> to do three performances in a row, and I'm, I'm guessing they're going to be different. I and hope so. It will, be, it will be probably affecting, you know, even affected by the weather outside. Well, let's hope the weather would not make that much of a difference, but... <laughs> yeah, but um, is, uh, when, before the concert, before a performance like this, is there something special you need to do? I don't know, like eat a lot of steak or, you know, get your strength... <laughs> Um, I used to have a lot of rituals growing up and actually eating a steak, a massive steak the day before performance was for a, for, for a certain period, a part of it. And, uh, I used to absolutely mandatory take a nap in the middle of the day, given the performance is an evening performance. And then I would need some t time alone with my focus and with my thoughts in, in, in a silence. And many, many other things uh, that I thought were necessary. But as time went by and I started traveling more and more, I found that having too big of a routine list is bad because most of the time you cannot accomplish it. There's either no opportunity to take a nap or you're traveling, there's not really a steak available, you know, things like that. Uh, I think that the general rule is not to practice too much the day before so your, your muscles and, you know, it's an athletic thing when you're playing a lot of, uh, when you're playing a program that, that is rather long and has a lot of, you know, many pianistic uh, difficulties <clears throat> to not practice too much the day before and have a good night's sleep. Sleeping is, 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 is important. I always, I always, I love to um, warm up in the, during, in, in, in a few hours before the performance and then not do anything and try not to get too much into my head. Uh, as I found there was a period of time I would try to really think about my program and I would focus to the point where I would actually burn myself emotionally. I would just get over overexcited and then even more overexcited and then I would go on stage and like half of the recital <laughs> was left backstage already with too too much of thinking. So yeah, take it take it take it easy. So uh if let's say you know because our audience comes from all kinds of backgrounds and some are uh, regular music attenders and they attend classical concerts all the time and some have never been to a classical music concert so if you have uh, an audience member who has never heard a uh, uh, music of list or uh, doesn't know much about the composer uh, how would you describe who List is and, and how he has influenced the music world and the piano world specifically? List is someone who felt and I will repeat myself in that but List was someone who was one of the first people that seriously thought that piano can emulate the orchestra he is somebody who is credited by, with expansion of what is possible on the, on the piano. And so is Beethoven. But they did a very, very different things because Beethoven was 
a musician with a very a structural and in the good sense academic thinking who was working on expanding the musical forms and structures and Liszt was expanding of idea in people's heads of what is possible on the instrument he started writing passages that would span entire keyboard he would uh, perform music by other composers that were not originally written for piano he would transcribe them and 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 play beethoven symphonies or songs by schubert or different different um, uh, uh, arias by verdi and and many many other things he would play them as original musical pieces would add a lot of ornamentation um and excuse me one second um yeah uh would uh would add a lot of ornamentation of different kinds there would be double thirds when you would have to play lines two lines at the same time with one hand there would be a lot of something like uh as the opposite of one line he would he would he would add passages in double thirds. He would add uh, octaves such as uh, uh, people like Beethoven. They did not really <laughs> do anything. I don't know how you guys <laughs> how, how does this tr transfers to you? It might be very noisy. But uh, he just put a lot of additional forces into a uh, pianist's hands and forever changed the idea of what a pianist can be because uh, he was touring performer, one of the first major virtuosos to tour, to perform not only his own music, but also music by others. and. Now, this is something we think of as a normal thing, but back in the 19th century earlier and before, performers were composers and they were, they were mainly performing their own stuff. So Liszt was opening eyes of a lot of people in his travels, performing music from operas that those people could not hear otherwise. He would be uh, introducing audiences to new composers. He was very supportive. He was um, rediscovering uh, music by other composers. And of course, making himself an, a name uh, that we still think of as uh, one, one of the greatest pianists of all time. Hi, sir. Um, thank you. Um, so <laughs> this is a lot of information. I can still continue. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, tell us a little bit about your childhood and uh, where you grew up and how did you find music? I mean, did you grow up in a musical family? Is that something that... Uh, was part of your life early on since the childhood? Yes, uh, both of my parents are musicians. My mother is a pianist and one of my, well, she's one of my first teachers, but she's the very first. Uh, she never really stopped completely being my teacher, but uh, she, she started teaching me when I was about four. And uh, that happened rather uh, in, in, in circumstances that uh, are rather unusual. Well, with m both of my parents uh, being musicians in uh, still Soviet Russia in the <clears throat> beginning of 80s, they did not want me to become a musician. They wanted me to have uh, a normal life and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> to to you know to have an opportunity to, to enjoy my you know being whatever but my mom was an active musician she was uh 
performing as a as a, a recitalist and as a chamber musician, and she was finishing her uh, a postdoctorate uh, in Gnesin Academy in in Moscow, and so she spent a lot of time practicing at home. And uh, evidently, I grew competitive, and I started kicking her out when I was about two and a half to three years old. She would, I would come and, and push her off and sit and f- pretend I'm practicing. And when she would try to remove me, I would just make complete scandal, and <laughs> it was it was very bad. Uh, and my study wasn't conventional at all. My my family traveled between three cities. Uh, my parents, when I was born, they were finishing their studies in Moscow, but there were also two sets of grandparents uh, in Izhevsk, where I was actually born, and in Kazan, where my parents uh, originally met in conservatory there. So we were traveling, and my mom made a decision that was very, very unpopular back then, and especially in Russia. She homeschooled me until I was about 10. And that uh, was a very, very strange and unconventional thing to do back then. But it allowed me to kind of always be around grown-ups and consume whatever food for thought uh, that they had. So, you know, I I started reading very early. I started, uh, my mom gave me catalogs of artwork to glance instead of, you know, regular kids' uh, picture books. So when I was like, you know, three on, or four, all the heroes from Rubens's artwork the Perseus and Andromede and all these uh, characters were my childhood heroes. It was very, um, very interesting and also prompted me to, to draw very, very early. And uh, I was seven. I was reading things like Divine Comedy and <clears throat> something, like, something similar like that, which is can be thought of as something... Too difficult for uh, for a kid to to read, but I was so excited. I read it twice <laughs> and made my own illustrations for that. But in my homeschooling, I also uh, was able to just go through a lot of material in different forms of art. Uh, and so when I finally went to school to the fourth grade, I was literally falling asleep on all art classes and literature because all these things I've read a long time ago that they that the kids were uh, having to discuss as a part of the school program. So that was the beginning of my upbringing. My father uh, is a obsessive record collector, so we were always listening to a lot of different kinds of music different kinds of classical music, because my my dad never really liked anything else. But um, hearing hearing that music was one thing, and of course I made my own favorites. Uh, But also, I think, an interesting impression for me that I now remember was watching my dad listen to music and getting moved by it. So through it sort was sort of <clears throat> through his eyes and through his ears, through watching his appreciation of certain things, it was easier to me to feel related to that, because I don't know I was maybe eight or nine and my dad was listening to a few Mahler symphonies, and he was crying, and I was l- listening to that massive amount of sound, watching my dad cry and getting really moved by by that. And up to this day, these pieces make the same reaction in me. And at certain point I started thinking, would I ever feel that close to Mahler have never I see my dad when I was growing up? 
loving that music so much. And I don't know, but it was very intense childhood in many ways because we at the same time traveled a lot and only settled uh, when I started going to school when I was 10. But crazy times. <laughs> Well, the first time I met you, uh, you actually lived in Miami at that time. And um, probably it was in 2011, I would think. And um, 12, must be 12. I, I arrived on, on the 12th, yeah. Okay, yeah, then 12, because I moved in 2010 to Miami. Um, how did you find your way to America? How did you end up here in the States? It's an awesome story. <clears throat> it's an awesome story uh, because um, my husband, so my husband's aunt, uh, lives in DC. And she uh, was encouraging him to visit a long, a long time, and he, he couldn't for a while. And in the very beginning of our relationship with him, back in 2007, he visited and um, kind of started uh, talking and uh, discussing m many things with her. And she always encouraged him, you should move to the States, you should move to the States. <laughs> A few years later, I applied uh, to Sarasota Music Festival because I wanted to uh, take uh, some lessons with Robert Levin and, and, and some other people. And in 2010, I applied and I did not get in uh, because I didn't get a visa. They, for some reason, denied me a visa. So the, the following year, I finally came and I came to Sarasota Music Festival and enjoyed that very much and performed with orchestra there and it uh, was a wonderful experience and got to perform with uh, Joseph Silverstein uh, conducting. It was, it was really, really memorable experience. And on the way back from that trip, I, vi I visited Dimitri, my husband's auntie in DC. And that was our first meeting. She said, Oh, you're 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 a pianist, and 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 oh, how wonderful! I'm a friend. I'm very good friends with one pianist who, who um, recently moved from College Park to to Miami. He's a wonderful, wonderful pianist, and she, he has a wonderful Russian wife, and we're very, very close friends. Um, and so she <laughs> she did the very, very funny thing. Uh, she, I had a CD of Transcendental Etudes that I recorded when I was 21, and I gave it to her as a, as a, as a gift. So she, not being a musician and not being a, a really someone who, who knows very much about music, she decided to ask her <clears throat> pianist friend whether I'm good or not, whether I'm, I know how to play two notes in a row or not, you know. <laughs> so she sent that CD to him, and this pianist's name is Santiago Rodriguez. <laughs> so long story short, at a certain point, <laughs> Professor Rodriguez gives a call back to uh, uh, our auntie and says, so what, what this girl is still doing in Moscow? <laughs> and um, he offered me to apply for a doctoral degree in the University of Miami, and uh, it was a crazy, uh, offer because he's like, well, if you apply and everything go goes well, you potentially can st start uh, next year. And we're talking about like summer of 2011 and me starting in the spring of 2012. And so I had to run around, collect materials, pass all the TOEFL tests and everything. And, but I was, that was that was a period of time when everything felt like like I'm sleeping because uh, it was so fast, so unexpected, and at the same time, uh, Professor Rodriguez is a legendary performer of Russian music. He's a Cuban American pianist, but he plays Russian music 
oftentimes better than Russians play Russian music. So an idea of studying with him, and it's like we had no idea that Dima's aunt uh, knows this uh, this person, and so it was just like upside down sort of events, uh, and uh, that's how I came to United States in 2012 permanently. She came and she never left. <laughs> that kind of story. <laughs> <laughs> she took over. Uh, for those of you uh, on social media, if you are on social media, Isa is incredibly active on social media, and she's probably one of the top people in my list, you know, where the artist is just so good at social media. You know, some of us are not good at it, but she is just incredible. And uh, what you post and your YouTube channel is really fantastic, Isa. So my compliments to you. I Thank admire you. your work. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a fan. Um, I actually would love to open it up to our audience. If any of you have questions, uh, feel free to ask uh, questions. Now you can unmute yourself or raise the hand and uh, we will un unmute you. And... Um, Okay, Bob, go ahead, unmute yourself. Ah, we, we cannot, still cannot hear you. You're still, okay, yeah. There we go. Okay, um, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Thank um, you, thank you. It's a me. real honor. And I have to tell you that I had an honor to meet you once before. Back in 2017, um, oh. you played, I think it was Beethoven's Choral Fantasy at Carnegie Hall, and I had the wonderful pleasure of being in the chorus and sitting right oh. by you while you played. And not only was I struck by the wonderful pianist that you are, but the fact that afterwards you would take time to talk to me and talk to the others, and you were just a, a very kind person. Thank so you. I thank you for your music and for being such a wonderful person. Thank you so much. It was, it was definitely uh, a very memorable experience. You know, I think I, I just want to elaborate a little more. Pianists, unless we are uh, a part of the orchestra, in the orchestra, or we are accompanying, we don't have many works where we can enjoy playing something substantial, being backed by a choir. So it is absolutely ethereal uh, feeling to play uh, choral fantasy and to have people around sing at the same time. It's just, it's absolutely divine. Well, it's divine for us too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, anybody else has a comment or question uh, about the upcoming program or about us is uh, journey in music. Greg? Um, what, is there anything in particular that you feel that uh, you play best or you're most proud of? That's a good question. <clears throat> I would say that I feel a very strong connection to the counterpoint and to sonata form in general. So to me, I think I can be quite successful playing things like Bach's works of different kinds of all tempered clavier or Goldberg variations or suites and things like that. And I definitely feel very connected to uh, sonata forms would that be sonatas by Beethoven or by Chopin or by Rachmaninoff or by composers of 20th century. Uh, and I would say that Liszt with time has become, instead of uh, a moment of overcoming fear and overcoming, you know, demands of, of difficulty uh, became an oasis of creativity and something that um, is very exciting and uh, I think I'm quite successful in dealing with that as well. 
Thank you. And I like your studio. <laughs> Fake background. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks very good. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Therese, uh, make sure you unmute yourself. Um, oh, this is uh, two questions. It sounds like because of his aunt, uh, you, you know, got to America and you continued your... You're breaking up. Um, if you could kindly, maybe you could type your question in the chat box. I don't think Therese, you're breaking up, unfortunately. Can you type in your question, maybe? We cannot hear you at all. <laughs> Slow connection. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, in the chat box, and I'll read it out. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, while Therese is, is, is uh, typing, I'll, I'll give you uh, a little anecdote. Uh, my very, very first performance in the United States at Sarasota Music Festival, I played Rachmaninoff, Paganini Rhapsody. And there were people lined up to, to say congratulations at the end. And at the very end of the line was this man who was... Um, had, had very small frame, had a walker, and clearly he had lived quite a life. So he came to me and with a very, very quiet voice said, Congratulations, my dear. I'm 98 years old. And I enjoyed the performance very much, but I have to say that I was in the audience when Mr. Rockman premiered this piece. <laughs> <laughs> Should I say that I flipped over? <laughs> Hopefully, he, he, it was a compliment anyway. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, it was just something absolutely insane. Okay, so how, how have you handled COVID isolation? I was blessed with uh, uh, how it went, and uh, both me and my husband were lucky to still not um, get uh, sick with it or anything. But to me, it was also an amazing and rare opportunity to be at home all the time. For quite many years, I wasn't home for more than three weeks at once. There was always traveling somewhere, performing, uh, giving master classes or doing different projects. And also, when you are in the circuit of performing, if it happens that you're spending more than two or three weeks at home, that means you don't have work. So that bears this strange psychological. Uh, explanation that if you're at home that means you, you're not engaged to do something somewhere so I know many performing musicians who, who, who do not really enjoy when they have long standby periods exactly for that reason and because of that you don't really get to enjoy fully being in your own house and uh, enjoying kind of rel more relaxed and still life it, it may sound, sound strange, but it's, it's true. So this year allowed me to spend nine, yeah, nine months at home and enjoy that quietness and allow the massive amount of free time to spend on all sorts of creative ideas in different regards in terms of learning things, writing things, drawing things, <laughs> building things and doing some house projects and planting some um, 
some flowers and uh, um, some uh, fruit trees and gardening in, in general and you know you know some some simple but very sweet uh, home things that uh, one can enjoy so in that way it was strangely therapeutic to me and there were things that I truly truly enjoy in that on the other side of course it was a time of uncertainty and fear for my loved ones and for my parents that are back in Russia and for my husband's part of family and uh, we lost some family members in this uh, period and um, it's been just as scary as for anyone else but I think it is good that despite all of that there were bright moments and things that were uh, nourishing for the soul <laughs> and so yes and my husband is not musician he is a sane guy in our, in our couple uh, so so that doesn't mean he doesn't have um, a drum set in the basement it doesn't doesn't mean he doesn't he didn't teach himself uh, to play certain Bach's preludes on his own after I taught him how to read notes. It doesn't mean that he uh, is not a insane fan of of uh, recordings and performances of different uh, things, and he's a big opera fan and uh, enjoys my world very much but he works in the field of IT and I can I can swear he understands about my world much more than I understand about his well <laughs> I guess he took time to explore maybe you don't have enough well, yeah it's been some years <laughs> it's been some years <laughs> right <laughs> Uh, well, anybody else has any comments or questions? Um, so, Asi is playing three recitals next week. Uh, I don't know if all of you are planning to be there um, at the concerts. I, th I think so. Uh, so, we will have a performance in the Breezeway in Bonita Springs um, on Monday, and then on Tuesday evening, I pray for good weather and not too chilly. Um, I told uh, I said to take something really warm, so we are still figuring it out, <laughs> just in case, you know. <laughs> well, strangely, it, it, it's such a strange concept to think of going to Florida and bring something warm. <laughs> but it depends on the context, I guess. <laughs> One thing that I wanted to <clears throat> that I haven't mentioned about the list etudes in general and I would like to uh, to let all of you know this program is very unique because of another one aspect uh, you know there are different types of composers for instance Mozart who was known uh, for taking a blank um, piece of paper uh, and just channeling whatever he had in mind, he would just write it down, and it was just perfect the way it is. There are people like Beethoven who would write sketches and then correct them and correct them and correct them and correct them, and then if you compare all the sketches, sometimes you barely can recognize in the first sketch what it has become. Uh, so it's 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 all it's. Channeling versus perfectionism. And they're all in the between that may happen. But there are also people who correct things, but in a different way. So 12 transcendental etudes list originally thought of as um, exercises for pianists. And he wrote these little etudes when he was 15. And majority of these pieces bear the same them thematic, same motifs that they have become years later. So he was 15, he wrote these 12 little 
exercises and moved on with his life. 17 years later, he took these 12 exercises, looked at them and thought, hmm, I'm going to expand them and make them more brilliant and more virtuosic. So he took the same motifs, expanded them, arranged them differently. They became bigger. And he edited them and uh, published them as a 12 uh, etudes in, in chromatic keys. And then 10 years after that, he looked at those etudes, again reworked them, expanded them further, mastered them in terms of form, uh, cut certain things out, brought certain things in, and they have become what we know today as transcendental etudes. Same happened to the Paganini etudes. There were some sketches when he was young, and then he wrote barely playable uh, etudes that very few people play just because it's, it, 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 it asks for enormous hands and it is just very inefficient. And then again, some seven, eight years later, reworked them again, and now everyone plays them in their final version, and as we know them as six etudes after Paganini. And same things happen to the, every single piece on this program that exists in the earlier, more simple, more kind of cute baby-like version. So this program is a sort of a manifestation of Liszt as a composer, as he literally brought half of his life into these pieces because some of them he worked on for more than 25 years combined. And I find that extremely fascinating. Fantastic. Thank you, Asim. We can't wait to hear them live. Uh, I'm sure I can absolutely with certainty say there's nobody else who is playing them right now in one concert, all 24 of them. So this is an incredibly rare event. And I don't think even in list competition they're doing that. I think they just have... Yeah, they're they playing sets, they're playing either transcendental etudes or Paganini etudes, or uh, they're playing complete sets on their own, but not all of them together. And even uh, th there are some people who recorded these as CDs, but... Um, for instance, Daniel Trefinov recorded 23 uh, lit etudes, but he forgot about the 24 hands on its own, and he never played the, the, the contents of that CD <coughs> once. He only played either, either concert etudes or Paganini etudes or transcendental etudes, but never everything together. So... We are looking forward to it. It's going to be a great event. Uh, we will cheer for you f as a sports person <laughs> and as a great performer, <laughs> you know, combined in one. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. So thank you, Asia, and thank you all for tuning in. We will see you at live events uh, next week. So... Thank you so much. Looking Thank forward you. to seeing all of you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.